Oh, yeah, thank you indeed for the introduction. Thanks, everybody. Um, actually, this semester I'm not uh, teaching because I did all my teaching in the fall, so that in the spring I could have lots of visitors and uh, travel a lot. So the, the plan is not exactly going uh, too well. But uh, uh, this means that mm, this talk is my first experience of uh, live remote lecturing because I haven't done any teaching this semester, so we'll see how it goes. And my plan is to talk about some um, recent work on uh, specification of uh, graphs and um, hypergraphs that has appeared in a series of uh, three papers with uh, Nikhil Bansal, Charles Carson, Alexandra Kolda, Nikhil Srivastava, and um, Olaf Benson. So the general um, set up, it's that given a um, graph G, it's useful to think of as a relatively dense graph, we would like to construct a, another graph over the same set of vertices, but with uh, much fewer edges, uh, such that uh, this much sparser graph H, even though it is a simpler graph with much fewer edges, it's a good approximation of the um, original one. In fact, this notion of uh, sparse approximation of uh, graphs, it's a broad topic. There's sort of, there is one interesting question for every interesting notion of uh, approximation. For example, you get the notion of uh, spanners if what you want to approximate are the shortest path distances. Here, the notion of approximation that we want to work with concern how cuts are approximated. So what we would want from uh, this graph H is that for uh, every subset of vertices, and the two graphs have the same set of vertices, so a subset of vertices in H is the same as subset of vertices in G, we would like the uh, cut induced in uh, G by this set, so the number of crossing edges, to be approximately equal to the cut in this graph. So the total weighted, because those edges are allowed to be weighted, the weighted number of uh, crossing edges in uh, H. And so we would like those two cuts to be approximately the same up to a small multiplicative error of uh, one times, one plus or minus epsilon. And so this notion, uh, if we call cut H the number of cut edges in H, cut G the number of cut edges in G, this is a weighted number of uh, cut edges. Uh, we would add two numbers to be the same up to small multiplicative error. That's a notion that was introduced by Ben Zur and Karger. And what they proved was that there is an efficient construction of uh, such a graph that is only of the order of uh, n over epsilon squared times log n edges. So n log n edges for a constant epsilon. And then later, Spielman and Tang proposed a um, stronger definition, one where instead of just all the cuts being preserved, it's also the Laplacian quadratic form that is preserved. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, in, in the definition of Spumain Tan, you're allowed to pick an arbitrary assignment of uh, real numbers to vertices, uh, and then you compute the sum over the edges possibly weighted of the difference of the labels of the endpoints, all squared. Now, the, the relevance of this expression is that if these real valued assignments of uh, real numbers to vertices are uh, a zero, one, then this expression, um, xu minus xv squared, can only be zero or one. And, uh, if you think of a zero one assignment as defining a cut, this expression will be one if, the, if this edge crosses from a zero vertex to a one vertex, and it will be zero otherwise. So zero one assignments of numbers to vertices correspond to cuts, and in that case, this expression corresponds to a number of cut edges. Arbitrary real number assignments will, will not have a combinatorial interpretation. So that's the definition of swimming in time is stronger because just the zero one case recovers the Benzur Karger 
definition, but then it has a lot of uh, additional cases. And it's a proper generalization because you can come up with the uh, pairs of graphs that are a good approximation of each other in uh, this sense of uh, Ben and Carger, but are poor approximations of each other in uh, this sense. And Spiro and Tang also provided an efficient construction of uh, graphs satisfying this definition. For every G, they could construct an approximating H with n over epsilon square times uh, polylog n edges. So still nearly linear number of edges for uh, every constant approximation. So this definition seems stranger, but is, it has a much neater linear algebraic uh, interpretation. It just says that the Laplacian matrix of H and Laplacian matrix of G are uh, kind of closely related in the PSD order. And the motivation for uh, this work came from uh, a, just a development of efficient uh, algorithms for the graph problems that involve cuts. The idea being that if I'm trying to at least approximately solve some graph problem that is determined by the cut structure of the graph, for example, uh, ST cuts or global mean cut, max flow, and so on. I might want to solve the problem not on the original graph, but on such a sparse approximator, because the result will be approximately the same. But if I run the algorithm on a sparser graph, it will run faster than if I run the algorithm on a dense graph. So that was the idea. But actually, it's also, an, um, in some cases, it can be an interesting way of uh, storing a compressed representation of the original graph. Here, it's compressed in the sense that it has fewer edges. So it takes fewer bits to, um, to store it. And uh, it, it still has some global information about the original graph, in particular, the cut structure flows, and so on. Uh, and now, for, for these applications, it's important that this approximating graph can be efficiently constructed. Uh, otherwise, any gain in efficiency we lose in the construction. And also that it should have as few edges as possible. But for, uh, uh, so the questions that we will look at in this talk, we'll focus um, pretty much exclusively on the question of uh, what is the smallest possible number of edges that we can get, even regardless of the efficiency of the construction. So here there are um, essentially tight bounds uh, in that Batson, Sima, and Srivastava proved that even the stronger definition that allows arbitrarily real number assignments, not just cuts, can be achieved using only of the order of uh, n over epsilon square edges. So linear number of edges for constant approximation epsilon. And even for the weaker definition, the one that is only about cuts, omega of n over epsilon square edges are necessary to approximate some graphs, such as the click. So the question of the number of edges is solved up to constant factors, but it turns out that, uh, so we wanted to explore what those constant factors were, and some interesting questions came up. So here is the situation for the spectral definition, the one that involves arbitrary real number assignments. So for uh, uh, when we allow, as in a definition, to get um, weighted graphs, uh, Batson, Spilman, and Srivastava proved that the approximation parameter epsilon needs to be at least roughly one over square root of the average degree. So here I've flipped the dependence on parameters before I was saying how many edges I need for a given epsilon. Uh, for those bounds, it's cleaner to look at uh, what is the best epsilon I can get for a given number of edges, so for a given average degree. So they say, well, uh, the best you can hope for, is, I mean, a lower bound is one over square root of the average degree. Now, in terms of constructions, and this bound holds for approximating the clique. But if we want to approximate a clique, uh, I mean, we could use the Batson, Spielman, Srivastava construction, 
but uh, we could also use Ramanujan graphs just by we will have to scale every edge by an appropriate factor so that the Ramanujan graph ends up having the same total weight of edges equal to the number of edges of the clip. Uh, so we will have to weigh every edge by n over d. But um, apart from this scaling, this is of an unweighted construction in which every edge gets the same degree. And the parameter epsilon it, is, it achieves is essentially the same as the spectral expansion of the approximating graph. And for the Manujan graphs, this is true divided by square root of the degree. So in terms of uh, what is the best approximation we can get for uh, the click with a given number of uh, edges, it's uh, somewhere between two over square root of D and one over uh, square root of D. But also, if our construction is not weighted, it just scaled, so all edges have the same weight, uh, then basically our approximating graph just has to be a regular or nearly regular expander to which the alombo pana theorem applies and says that Ramanujan graphs are the best that you can hope for. Yeah. 2 over square root of d is also a lower bound. And so we thought that uh, there was a interesting question here, which is uh, when we want to approximate a click, possibly with an arbitrarily weighted graph, can we use fewer edges if we allow some strange weighting scheme compared to what we get from uh, Ramanujan graphs? Or uh, are Ramanujan graphs the best approximation of the click for a given number of uh, edges, meaning that in the case, there is a alombo pana type theorem also for graphs that are uh, irregular and uh, potentially weighted. So we uh, so approach the question of what is the best lower bound here. So our, the first result that I want to mention is that we do prove a sort of alombo pana theorem for graphs that are possibly weighted and uh, irregular. So what we say is that for every graph of uh, h of average degree dh, no matter what uh, is average degree, so some nodes could have degree n, some nodes could have very small degree and so on. So no matter what's the degree distribution and no matter how those edges are weighted, the epsilon by which it approximates the click has to be at least uh, two over square root of D. Uh, so that sort of resolves the situation for the click and for uh, general graphs, the construction of Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava achieves two square root of two over square root of D. So there is still a square root of two gap between upper bound and lower bounds. Okay. So here there is a asterisk because there is a bit of a fine print. So our lower bound holds if the approximating graph H has large girth. Uh, so we can get this assumption with a loss of generality when we sort of study how to approximate general graphs. We have to force it when uh, we look at the click. So it is still an open problem whether a completely arbitrary graph that tries to approximate the click with a given number of edges um, has this lower bound on how well it approximates the click or not. So intuitively having large curves shouldn't help at all but we are not able to remove that assumption. Question? Yeah. So is it clear why or can you say something about why for a general graph you can force the girth? To ah, yeah, so uh, maybe there should be another asterisk uh, there also. Uh, so the definition of uh, sparsifier that we take is that H has to be, the, the edges of H have to be a subset of the edges of G. Uh, all the known constructions work like this. Uh, somehow, you, you could allow a definition in which the edges of H are completely arbitrary, uh, 
uh, but uh, and then our lower bound would not uh, hold in that case. So the argument here would be that if we take G to be a kind of dense, very good expander, say a Ramanujan graph of degree log n, then it will have large curve. It will be little of one close to the click. So any way in which you approximate that graph, you also approximate the click with the same factor. But now, since you're only allowed to take a subset of those edges, uh, you have to construct an approximator that has large girth also. And so the, the lower bound holds in that way. But they thought we were approximating a general graph, not the click. Uh, right. So in this lower bound, um, so the lower bound holds for some graph. Right? The mm -hmm. construction has to work for uh, all graphs. Okay. What I call a lower bound, it's exhibiting one graph that you cannot approximate better than uh, some factor. So what I will uh, do here is to say, well, let G be a large girth expander of uh, super constant degree, like a Ramanujan graph of degree log n. And now let H be any edge induced subgraph of G, but it can be weighted in any way, which has to be average, which has to have average degree D bar. Now, how well does H approximate G? It approximates G pretty much exactly as well as it approximates a click, because we took G to be a super constant degree expander. So the distance in this sense between G and the click is little o one. And so now H needs to be a graph of uh, large girth because it's a subgraph of G. It needs to approximate the click because that's the only way of approximating G. And so now the question becomes how, how well can a graph with a given number of edges and without short cycles approximate the click? Okay. Here we know that the answer is 2 over square root of D. Uh, did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yes. okay. So the, then there is also this question of two root two versus uh, two for uh, general graphs. Uh, so there is a very strong intuition that the click should be the hardest graph to approximate. And so that there should be, it should be possible to do a little bit better than BSS and get two here, even in the construction. However, BSS, a kind of proves a stronger result than just constructing an approximator for uh, every graph. And in particular, in a way that maybe now it's not worth to go too much uh, into, it provides the approximation in an online way. It's like uh, you could get it to work even if uh, somehow, a, 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 as their construction picks edges for the approximation, uh, it sort of asks something about the graph and uh, you could change the graph from uh, step to step. And, and then at the end, the things will still work for in some sense, the average of the graphs that you picked at every way. Uh, for this online setting, this two root two over uh, root D is actually the best possible. So to get a better construction, it needs a, at least a somewhat different proof. Like you need the proof that doesn't work in this online, that doesn't solve this online problem also. Because for this online problem, two root two is the best you can hope for. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about this two over root the lower bound on uh, how well an irregular graph of large girth can uh, approximate a click. Uh, first, let me tell you what the alombo Panna theorem looks like in uh, graphs of large curve, where the argument is uh, simpler. So here, what you want to do is to come up with a labeling of vertices by real numbers, such that the Laplacian quadratic form in the click and in your graph looks uh, significantly different. And uh, the assignment 
that comes up in the Alombo Pana theorem in their proof is to um, pick some arbitrary vertex and uh, label it by one. Then um, there is sort of a reason why you don't so want to leave this vertex one neighbor alone. Uh, otherwise, you uh, label the other d minus one vertex neighbors by one over root d minus one. Here, this is the degree. And then you label the neighbors of the neighbors by one over d minus one and so on. So you reduce the labels by a factor of one over square root of d minus one, every step away from this original vertex. And then you truncate the construction after some number of steps. So all vertices that are more than distance k for some k away from the start vertex are just labeled zero. Uh, and here k is chosen to be sufficiently smaller than the girth. Right, so then you can compute the, uh, those quadratic forms and uh, you're going to see a, a sort of uh, um, error compared to what things would be in the click, which is exactly of the order of uh, two over square root of d, plus an extra factor that depends on uh, how many steps you went in uh, this construction. Sorry. So what you get is something like uh, two over square root of d plus one over k. So it, the grid is sufficiently large, this extra factor is negligible. Uh, so our idea was to think of so what would a, what could be a construction that you can define for every graph, even if it's weighted and potentially irregular, and that kind of becomes a lombo pana if the graph happens to be regular and uh, unweighted. So we uh, thought of it in the following way. Uh, so we thought of uh, taking a non backtracking walk in this graph starting from uh, a particular start vertex. Again, sort of ignoring the issue that one neighbor is treated a bit differently. So then uh, in this case, it's like imagine you, you start the walk here, you decide that this is going to be your first step and then you proceed in a non backtracking way after that. Uh, so then what happens that uh, the labels of those vertices are precisely the square root of the probability that those vertices are uh, reached by this walk. Uh, if the walk is chosen to be of length equal to the so length of the unique path from the start vertex to those vertices. Uh, and now that's a quantity that can be defined for um, arbitrary graphs, uh, even if they are weighted. You could say, well, take the number tracking work in which an edge is selected with probability proportional to its weight. Uh, and now if we, if we do this construction, starting from a random start vertex, and then we look on average over the choice of the random start vertex, what is the discrepancy in uh, this assignment of labels to vertices in an arbitrary bounded degree graph, bounded average degree graph compared to a click. And so do the calculations at some point, it comes up that by convexity, the worst case is when all the weights are equal and all the degrees are equal and it's sort of what is already solved by the uh, Alonbo Pana reason. Okay. So that's in two minutes roughly what uh, our uh, lower bound looks like. But to be able to reason about these walks, it really helps a lot to assume that the graph has larger girth than the walks that we think of. So that um, there is really only one way to uh, reach every vertex. Probably the same construction also works to give a lower bound for uh, arbitrary graphs. Uh, 
but we have not been able to um, uh, reason about that without the GERT assumption. Okay, so then we thought of a somewhat different style of uh, lower bound problem, uh, which was the fact that the, earlier I said that um, one way to think of what a sparsifier is good for is that it gives a compressed representation of the original graph. And so that the quality of this compression depends on uh, how many edges it has. And the usefulness of this compression is that it tells us everything, at least in an approximate way, about the cut structure of the graph. So now let's really think of it as a data structure that um, the number of bits that it takes to store this data structure is roughly log n bits per edge to sort of store the names of the endpoints and uh, weight up to some inverse polynomial error. And then, the, uh, and then what does it do? Uh, what kind of questions can this data structure answer? For every cut, it answers an epsilon approximation of uh, the number of crossing edges for that cut. Uh, so it does that with one over epsilon squared times uh, n log n bits of storage if you use the batson spielmann srivastava construction. Uh, but could there be a better data structure for this problem? So there actually, uh, there's been studies of uh, sketching for graphs. Uh, it, so sketches are basically data structures that um, allow you to reconstruct some information about the data that you have sketched. And this work was looking at whether you can sketch uh, graphs in a way that you can recover uh, either just cuts or even the whole Laplacian quadratic forms. So John Bulapati and Sid Ford studied the harder problem of sketching graphs so that you can recover approximately the quadratic form. Uh, so in that case, they were saying, well, if I, um, I don't really need to create a sketch that correctly answer all the cut queries. Uh, I could do a probabilistic construction that for uh, every fixed query has a high probability like one minus inverse polynomial probability of giving a correct answer. So after I do this randomized construction and someone asks me polynomial in many queries, we will get all the queries right. Even though information theoretically, the sketch is not stored in the whole cut structure of the graph. And if you kept asking questions, eventually you will get uh, incorrect answers. So for this setup, they were able to show that something like N over epsilon times polylog n bits suffice. Uh, but uh, even earlier, uh, Andoni and others proved that even just to store cuts, n over epsilon squared bits are necessary if you want your data structure to be able to correctly answer all questions. So like if you want the actual, like all the exponentially many cuts be stored correctly in the data structures. So there is this interesting gap between kind of n over epsilon that suffice to answer polynomially many queries and n over epsilon squared that is necessary to answer all possible queries. Uh, but if you see, I mean, it's, a, it's a small thing, but it was bothering us. Uh, there is still a gap between the lower bound of Andoni and others and what you get from uh, BSS because they were arguing n or epsilon squared bits are necessary, but it actually takes n or epsilon squared times log n bits to store a sparsifier. Uh, so the, the next result I want to tell you a bit about it, it's, uh, it's <laughs> closing this gap also. So it's arguing that kind of, no matter what data about your graph you store, if you want this data to be enough to tell you about all cuts with a epsilon approximation, you need to store n over epsilon squared times log n bits of information. So as much up to a constant factor 
a certain number of bits that suffice to store a VSS sparse file. Okay, um, so how do we go about uh, uh, proving this result? Uh, it basically it's a counting argument. So we say, uh, you know, let's just think about two graphs, any two graphs that are not good sparsifiers of each other, like such that there is a cut that cuts noticeably different number of edges in G1 and in G2. Well, then you cannot have the same data structure work for uh, both graphs. Because if you ask the data structure about that cut, it cannot be simultaneously a good approximation for both G1 and G2. So in order to get a lower bound on uh, how many bits your data structure needs, you can sort of argue about how many different data structures have to exist. So if you find lots of graphs that are not good approximations of each other, you will need a different data structure for each of those graphs. So if our goal is to argue that data structure needs to store n over epsilon square times log n bits, we need to find exponentially many in n over epsilon square log n graphs, uh, such that any two of them are not good uh, approximators of each other. And maybe another way to think about what I just said is that you could think of uh, this gigantic graph that has one vertex for every n vertex graphs. And then there is an edge if uh, these two graphs are good approximators of each other. So they, um, they could share the same data structure. And there is no edge if they're not good approximators of each other. So they cannot share the same data structure. Now you want to say that this gigantic graph has a large independent set. So one way to argue that a graph has a large independent set is to argue it as bounded degree. So uh, that's kind of what we uh, do. We focus just on uh, graphs that are uh, regular of degree a little less than one over epsilon squared. And then we say that uh, every graph of this type can be a good, can share a data structure with not too many other graphs of this type. Okay. So the uh, number of uh, graphs of this type, it's exponential in uh, dn log n. The number of d regular graphs where d is a constant is roughly exponential in uh, dn log n and we're going to argue the degree it's uh, the square root of the number of vertices so the independent set is also at least the square root of the number of vertices so that's the lower bound okay so in fact we will uh, uh, so how do we argue that so when you look at fairly sparse regular graphs uh, not too many pairs of them can be good approximations of each other. So we argue that if you look at two fairly sparse regular graphs, in order to be good cut approximators of each other, they must have a lot of edges in common. And this cannot happen for too many uh, pairs of graphs because then your degrees of freedom are just the remaining edges. Uh, and so you take the Contrapositive of that, we want to argue that if you have two sparse regular graphs with uh, not too many edges in common, it's possible to find the cut that noticeably distinguishes between those two graphs. And the way that we do that is to think about the SDP relaxation of this question of finding distinguishing cuts kind of writing down by hand a feasible solution and then rounding it by a Gaiman's field and some uh, hybrid plane rounding. So when uh, all of this is taken together, it's arguing that to get data structures that approximate with error epsilon, all cuts 
of a given graph on n vertices, you need at least another epsilon square times log n uh, bits matching BSS. Right, this was the second result that I wanted to uh, tell you about. Uh, next, I, so I wanted to return to this picture of the upper bounds and lower bounds that we have for uh, the spectral definition. And actually return to this distinction between uh, constructions that are unweighted, again, in a sense that every edge is just scaled by the same factor, as opposed to allowing different edges to have totally different weights, and uh, general constructions. So for uh, general graphs, uh, it's actually not possible in general to hope for a good construction that is unweighted in the sense that uh, all edges are the same scaling factor. And a prototypical example, it's a dumbbell graph. I suppose you want to find a sparse approximation of this graph, but one in which uh, all edges are weighted the same, just the scaling factor. So now imagine, so this is our graph uh, G. Now imagine what uh, H might uh, look like. So one possibility is that in H, uh, there is going to be uh, no edge crossing this cup. Uh, but then here there is one edge crossing this cup. Here there are zero edges crossing this cup. So the error is infinite. Because we're looking about the ratio between uh, the cuts. So we need to choose some edge crossing this cut. But now every edge in this unweighted construction needs to be weighted the same by scaling factor. So even if you just want to choose half of the edges of G, you need to weigh every edge by factor of two. Uh, otherwise, a random cut will not work. But now here, uh, oops. But now here, this cut was cut by one edge. Here, it's cut by edges of uh, uh, total weight two. So, in fact, if you want kind of any non-trivial uh, specification, you'll need some non-trivially large scaling factor, and uh, you're going to mess up this graph. So, for some graphs, unweighted constructions are not possible, although for some other graphs, unweighted constructions are possible. Uh, like a, um, a click is very well approximated by a scaled uh, expander. A bipartite graph is very well approximated by the scaled uh, bipartite expanders. So like, for what graphs are there unweighted constructions that we can think of as some kind of generalizations of the notion of uh, expanders? It's sort of graphs that are to these other graphs what uh, expanders are to clicks. So in fact, one of the interesting corollary of the Marcus Spielman's Rivastava proof of the Kalison singer conjecture is that every graph in which all the edges have bounded effective resistance admit a unweighted sparsifier with roughly the same number of edges of the BSS construction, order of n for constant epsilon. And for example, this applies to uh, all graphs that are uh, edge transitive, such as the hypercube. It also applies to graphs that have constant normalized ed edge expansion, even if they're dense. So if you take a dense expander, it must have a sparse expander inside of it. Uh, but more remarkably, uh, if you look at the hypercube, uh, you fix some epsilon like one tenth, there is some uh, uh, graph of uh, constant maximum degree that uh, approximates all the cuts of the hypercube up to an error of 10%. So it sort of knows about the dimension cuts that have to be sort of cut with expansion one over the dimension. 
So he knows about two degree polynomials, he knows about the majority cut. But all of this happens just with uh, a constant number of edges per the vertex, uh, constant uh, maximum degree. Uh, so in fact, we have a number of explicit constructions for this, but nobody has any idea actually what this constant degree approximator of the upper cube uh, looks like. And I think it's a very interesting question. Maybe it doesn't have a, any kind of closed formula definition, but uh, at least achieving it algorithmically, I think would be very interesting. I mean, can the short code kind of thing be a good approximator there? Uh, no, but the short code has fewer vertices, doesn't have fewer edges. That's right, that's right. So it's kind of uh, answer a slightly different question. <laughs> uh, so in fact, I think, um, so since we are, uh, uh, so imagine things you might as well, imagine them uh, uh, better and better. Uh, it would be nice, like this is a kind of, uh, maybe not even conjecture, but like idea, I think it's uh, really very nice to, uh, so come up with some notion of uh, specification that it's uh, equivalent to the standard notion, say the spectral notion for graphs where all the edges have bounded effective resistance, but also that is achievable for uh, all graphs in an unweighted way with an explicit construction. So this would give a constructive uh, way of uh, proving that corollary of the Carlson signal conjecture. But it will also say something about the ability to approximate all graphs by some kind of uh, unweighted and um, scale graph. Uh, I mean, one could um, come up with a statement that is true from Carlson Singer. Uh, uh, it would be kind of ugly, but maybe there's something nicer and something with a constructive proof. So although we so don't make any progress, much progress on, um, so it's kind of dream. Uh, let me say something about notions of specification that are achievable for all graphs in an unweighted way. Starting from trivial things, like um, uh, if I have a graph G and I just subsample a subset of edges, and then scale them appropriately. Uh, well then, they will actually satisfy a notion of cut approximation. There will be, it will be an approximation in cut norm. So what will happen is that for uh, every cut in the uh, original graph versus my graph, the difference will be at least, uh, with, the difference will be at most epsilon times the total number of edges. Um, this you can argue just from uh, Chernobyl bounds and union bounds. Uh, but if I say, well, can I do this with a polynomial time deterministic construction? So can I de-randomize the argument that comes from Chernobyl bounds and union bounds? It's already a non-trivial question. And in fact, I don't know of uh, any reasonably simple argument that will give me a polynomial time construction with n over epsilon squared uh, edges here. Um, so one um, result that proved with Nikhil Bansal and um, Ola Swenson is that we, actually, maybe before talking, talking about this result, uh, let me bring up a sort of conce conceptual issue why this seems like a not entirely trivial problem. That um, if I come up with a deterministic construction of a certain object, then the deterministic, so the transcript of the algorithm and the proof of correctness of the algorithm together will give me a certificate that what I constructed satisfies the property that I'm looking for. So a prerequisite to have a deterministic polynomial time construction is to be able to have certificates that a given graph H and a given graph G 
are in this kind of uh, relationship with each other. Uh, but this is actually, can yeah. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, do we know that the Baston, uh, Spielman Silvastova proof does not give uh, essentially an unweighted result in the case that the effective resistances are all bounded? Yeah, we know. Uh, you can uh, kind of trace the weights that they assign and the, if you want a two-sided uh, inequality, somehow one side is easier than the other. And uh, there is one side that uh, really forces you to uh, choose potentially really big weights in certain cases. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so here we sort of follows, we follow what goes on in uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, particularly in the way in which Alan Ju, Liao, and Norekia reinterpret it, that it's easier to uh, work with. Okay, so we reason about different matrices than they do, we don't do the normalization that they uh, do. There is a trick to avoid what I just said to Avi, and there is a step where um, even if you're trying to approximate a click, you might end up picking really um, uh, big weights, but we end up satisfying this um, weaker definition. So the certificate that we have is that uh, um, this combinatorial property has a spectral stronger version. So if you get a stronger version, we we'll get this. And the stronger version is that uh, you want to say that the uh, difference between the Laplacians of the graph that you start from and the graph that you want to use as an approximation is bounded in a PSD sense by a diagonal matrix of a small trace. This is basically, you take this problem, you do SDP relaxation, this is what the dual looks like. Uh, and so our construction will actually also construct uh, those matrices, which will just look like, uh, like on one side, this will look like uh, epsilon times the degree matrix of G. On the other side, it will uh, look a bit messier. Um, Okay, so that, that, that's one definition that makes sense for uh, uh, all graphs. It's kind of trivial probabilistically. It should not be too hard to do it deterministically, but uh, um, so the only argument that we got, it's uh, about the same complexity as DSS. Okay, so then uh, we turn to definition is less trivial. Uh, like it's not clear at all that it's um, achievable in general. And that was suggested by Shoyano Ves Garon. So here uh, we would like to say that um, the error in approximating cuts between uh, G and H is bounded, like for now just think of G as being regular of degree D, is bounded by epsilon times the volume of S. Uh, so that's interesting because if G is an expander, uh, this is roughly the number of cut edges uh, between S and B minus S. So this is actually a multiplicative error as in the original definition. So it captures the original definition for uh, if G is a dense expander, uh, but it gives something non-trivial for every graph. It says every cut is approximated uh, up to an error that is epsilon times the number of edges incident on the small side of the cut. Yeah. Uh, this also has a, a clean linear algebraic uh, version, which just says that the Laplacians of the two matrices have to be closed in, in operator norm. Now, if you just randomly pick uh, n or epsilon squared times log n edges, uh, we know 
just uniform neutrino, just subsample n or epsilon squared times uh, log n edges, uh, and then scale them. You can use metrics turn of bounds to argue that you achieve even the stronger spectral definition. Uh, but what we really wanted to see was a construction with the uh, order of n edges for constant epsilon. Okay, now you see that um, there is a problem not a problem, but like, it's not clear how you go about it. Because um, basically you can never get constructions, well, it seems you can never get constructions that use order of n edges if you proceed by a probabilistic argument in which you pick each edge with some probability. Because when you get to very sparse graphs, those arguments will construct graphs that are not even connected. But when you pick random graphs with independent edges, even to achieve connectivity, and much less these sort of fine approximations, you need n log n edges. And in fact, um, all the non constructions of sparsifiers that have order of n edges, well, really one constructions, the BSS construction, all the others are reinterpretations, it's a deterministic construction something that uh, sort of picks each edge one at a time and uh, so uses some potential function to make sure that then everything is fine. Um, but those potential functions are defined in such a way that they tend to create very kind of widely uh, weighted uh, graphs. So here, I, so I cannot explain why you get this very different weights without kind of diving into a particular step in the proof. But that seems to be something that shows up in uh, their arguments. So the way we're able to show that this is achievable for every graph in an unweighted way with um, order of n or epsilon squared times log one over epsilon uh, edges, it's by picking edges randomly but then, um, so that doesn't work with high probability. In fact, with high probability, the graph will not even be connected. But we show that it works with low probability. And in particular, the, the lowest local lemma can be used to uh, argue that the construction will work. Um, here, the argument looks a bit like uh, the Uh, like construction is in the paper of below and lineal uh, that shows that every graph has a um, signing of the adjacency matrix with uh, bounded eigenvalues. values. They first prove a related combinatorial property of this matrix using the lowest local lemma, and then they show that this combinatorial property is, implies the spectral property. And we kind of go through fairly similar steps. Uh, however, the way it works is that the known ways of making Lovas local lemma constructive apply. So this is actually a probabilistic uh, polynomial time construction. Uh, so in particular, something that we didn't know how to do before, if we have a dense expander graph, we can find a unweighted sparsifier of it um, in polynomial time. So here, this error is bounded in terms of the maximum degree, but um, there is a easy reduction to a um, potentially tethered bound where this is but in terms of the average degree of the graph times uh, the size of s plus the volume of s. So if the graph is very irregular, but just with a few vertices of very big degree, uh, in the error, we just need to pay the average degree, not the maximum degree. Uh, but this is just a black box reduction to the case that I, um, Showed in the previous slide. 
Okay, so now just one more. Uh, um, so this so took a bit longer than I had planned. Just want to tell you about one uh, final result which concerns uh, so similar notions of specification, but for uh, remind or maybe I need to say to the audience in the beginning, but this talk is planned to be longer than the normal one hour, so we definitely allow another half hour or whatever we need. Yeah, I think the room is not reserved for uh, <laughs> for noon. Uh, right, so I wanted to um, tell you about one final result that concerns uh, specification of uh, hypergraphs. And in the setting of uh, hypergraphs, we can sort of define both cuts in a sort of standard way, but also there is a by now, I don't want to say standard, but um, well-studied notion of uh, what is an interesting notion of uh, Laplacian quadratic form for uh, hypergraphs. So in a hypergraph, I would say an upper edge is cut by a partition of the vertices if the upper edge has sort of some vertices on one side and also uh, at least one vertex on the other side. So an upper edge is cut by a partition of the vertices in two subsets if it intersects both sides of the partition. It's not cut if it's uh, entirely on one side. Uh, and so a hypergraph approximates another if uh, all cuts are approximately the same. So given a hypergraph H, the goal would be to find uh, a sparser hypergraph H prime with much fewer hyper edges, but it approximates all the cuts. The mm, kind of Algebraic version of this, it's um, a bit uh, harder to parse, but it's still kind of a relaxation of this notion. So now, instead of thinking about cuts of the vertices, we want to think about arbitrary real valued assignments uh, uh, to the vertices. So every vertex V gets a real number XV. And uh, we want to say that the um, following expression is roughly the same for the two hypergraphs. In this expression, we sum over the hyper edges E, possibly with weight. And then what we sum, it's the maximum difference squared between uh, the numbers that we see on some um, hyper edge. So if we see some, like if there are some vertices uh, maybe labeled by uh, two minus one and five, and those are part of a hyper edge, then the contribution of this hyper edge to this expression will be the maximum difference that we can get between two of those numbers. So that will be uh, five plus one uh, squared. So it will be 36. And uh, the sort of point of uh, this definition is that if we give a zero one assignment to the vertices, and then we evaluate this expression, if the upper edge has all zeros or all ones, this difference will be zero, there will be no contribution. But if some vertices are zero and some vertices are one, then this expression will be exactly one. And that's what it will contribute to the expression. So, for zero one assignments, this expression counts the number of uh, cut hyper edges. For uh, arbitrary real numbers, it's sort of a, it's not a quadratic form because it is this max. Thing. It's, it's some function of the expression and it also has an interpretation in terms of the diffusion process or on a hypergraph. Uh, when you look to minimize this expression where all x is orthogonal to all ones, you get a quote unquote second eigenvalue of this Laplacian that satisfies the Chigar inequality. So in many ways it behaves like the Laplacian of a graph. So it's interesting to see an approximation of it. 
so what do we know about this? Uh, Kogan and Krogammer uh, proved that you can uh, approximate every hyper edge, sorry, every hypergraph with a sparser hypergraph that has um, of the order, so the uh, exact expression, I think was something like uh, order of uh, n times uh, r plus log n um, hyper edges, where n is the number of vertices, r it's the um, rank or order of the hypergraph. So it's uh, how many vertices at most are in each uh, hyper edge. And this log n. Uh, and so their construction approximates all the cuts. And it's pretty much the benzor Karger construction, where so every step is retaught in terms of uh, hypergraphs. And, um, and in the, but for the uh, spectral definition, and so this was proposed, this was studied, and Soma and uh, Yoshida proved that one can get it with order of uh, n cube apparatus. And so their construction works for every oddity of the hyperedges. But say, if the graph has hyperedges of size three, their construction uh, doesn't give any non-trivial bound because already we know that cannot be more than n cube um, hyperedges. Okay, so the last result that I want to tell you about, it's a construction that uses uh, of the order of uh, R cubed times sin log n hyper edges for constant epsilon. Otherwise it's, uh, um, it's that times uh, one over epsilon squared, if you also include the parameter epsilon. So it's not actually always better than so many you should have, but for uh, hyper edges of constant size, it uses n log n hyper edges mm, compared to n cube. Here, actually, one of my favorite questions is whether even just the cut definition can be achieved with the uh, order of n hyper edges without the log n. And uh, maybe I'll return to why I find this question so interesting in a moment. Uh, so, just like uh, Kogan and Krogammer, where taking the proof of uh, Benzur and Karger and kind of adapting every step to hypergraphs. Uh, here we took uh, the proof of uh, Spilma and Srivastava that gets sun log and hyper edges and sort of worked with it. The, uh, so the argument of Spilma and Srivastava is that uh, you can assign a probability to every edge according to its effective resistance. Then you're going to just sample edges independently according to those probabilities. Uh, and then every selected edge will be weighted by the inverse of the probability with which it was picked. So that basically every edge is going to have weight, say you have some edge uh, that is uh, weighted, that there's some probability P in H. So then in each prime there are two possibilities. Uh, either it doesn't exist, and this happens with probability um, one minus p, or it exists with probability p, and then it has weight one over p. So the average weight of that edge is one, which is the same as it had in H. So every cut, in fact, every quadratic form has um, on average the same weight as before. So the point is, how are those concentrated? Spilman and Srivastava uh, just use as a black box channel bounds for sums of random matrices to argue that this will be concentrated for every quadratic form. Uh, so here, we cannot use those bounds, but we can kind of use the way in which matrix journal bounds are proved. So there is one proof that just follows the proof of the journal bounds. It's just that 
uh, some things that are trivial for numbers become much harder with matrices because they don't commute. But it's also a way to prove some version of metric channel bounds by using Telegram's theory of uh, genetic chaining and uh, majorizing measures. So that's a theory that allows you to bound the supremum of uh, a random function uh, across a um, uh, uncountable set of possibilities, which is kind of what these spectral problems are like, where you want uh, uh, some expression to be bounded for every real value that summons to vertices, which is an uncountable space. Um, and so we can um, uh, we can use uh, Telegram's uh, setup, actually relatively elementary parts of it. It's not a very complicated proof to uh, argue that after sampling n log n upper edges according to the probabilities that we choose, we will get the spectral bound. Okay, so I told you about uh, these four results. Uh, one is something that is in the spirit of the Alombo-Pana theorem, but for graphs that are possibly not regular and weighted. So we said that as long as a graph has large girth, which is an assumption that we don't know how to remove, but should not be there, um, there is a lower bound to how well this graph can uh, approximate a click. And it's basically two over square root of the average degree, uh, just like uh, how well a Ramanujan graph can approximate a click. Uh, then uh, we argued about how many bits it takes to store the cut information about a graph, which is contained in a cut sparsifier. We argued it's uh, n over epsilon squared times log n bits, just as many bits as it takes to store the sparsifier. So from this point of view, it's an optimal data structure. Uh, uh, then we argued about unworthy notions of sparsifications that are available for all graphs. And for constant approximation error epsilon, need only order of n uh, edges. Uh, and then we, uh, showed that the spectral version of uh, what it means for a graph to be sparsified is achievable with uh, order of n log n hyper edges if the size of the hyper edges is bounded. Okay, so maybe there is some philosophy of why we thought that those problems were uh, uh, interesting. So in terms of the notion of unworthy specification that we studied, like not the really trivial one where you bound in terms of the total number of edges, but the one where you bound in terms of the volume of the small set of the cut. So this seemed to be uh, one, of, one of the cases where you can sort of get it with a probabilistic construction in which things are independent, but then and then we maybe use matrix churn of bounds. But then you're going to use uh, n log n edges because that's, so the minimum it takes for a construction based on uh, independence to work with high probability. Uh, but when you want to, so this is so similar to uh, sort of what it takes to construct a, good random graphs or even sets of small discrepancy, that sometimes there's some extra log n that comes from the fact that you're starting a probabilistic construction and you want it to work with high probability. Uh, but that log n in some cases is not necessary and if you want to get rid of it, um, there are not a lot of, there are a few options to uh, do it, but uh, uh, not a lot. So just so to see what kind of things can, uh, can be done. So one is to construct this object kind of one step at a time. So there is really no probability anymore. And then use some potential function to argue that you're making progress towards what you are trying to achieve. 
in a way, that's what the PSS looks like to construct with its specifiers. The lowest local lemma is sometimes can be made efficient, although it's always typically hard to be randomized. Uh, so it's a probabilistic method, but it allows to work in situations where things uh, work with small probability. And for example, there's the Bilu linear construction of uh, near Ramanujan graphs. Uh, and then we have non-constructive techniques like the ones of uh, MSS. They kind of are back, and we can think of them as being deterministic constructions with a potential function but with a potential function that we don't know how to compute. So, so far those results are not constructed. And uh, they've had all kinds of uh, applications, uh, including, for example, the fact that for some graphs you can get unweighted specifiers. So, uh, so maybe not entirely fair way of uh, thinking about what you're doing is that here there is a sort of, uh, a, so below this line, there are things that we only know how to do with uh, MSS type results. And so only, you know, constructively. And uh, so to me, so working these unweighted specification questions um, allows to show that at least one of the things that we only know how to get from um, MSS, maybe not its most exciting corollary, but one of the kind of things that we know how to do with those techniques and not with others are achievable with uh, techniques that we know how to turn uh, explicit. So kind of cross this line between explicit and non-explicit. And so the reason why, so this is my justification for thinking about these problems about unwilling specifiers. And so my, the, the reason why I thought those problems on uh, hypergraphs were interesting is that um, sort of most of the spectral graph theory that we have developed to so have lots of applications in graphs doesn't have clean generalizations to hypergraphs and there are also kind of uh, barrier, barriers to having that sort of generalization. So, um, kind of spectral specification of graphs relies very heavily on um, uh, starting with the definition of the problem on uh, spectral graph theory and uh, linear algebra. So, having a, a kind of generalization of uh, something for which linear algebra seems uh, essential, even if maybe it's not the most exciting application of linear algebra to graphs, I think fits into a program of maybe in the longer run, getting more useful spectral graph theory algorithms and results to also work on uh, hypergraphs and some higher dimensional data. In this respect, I think that, um, getting um, even cut hypergraph specifiers with the uh, order of n hyper edges, it's a really interesting question because um, unless maybe we find some way of doing that with the, with the lowest local lemma, so the only other option is to follow the style of uh, BSS. But uh, so kind of come up with some potential function, get one hyper edge at a time and show that we're making progress. But BSS is so um, kind of contained into, there's so much general algebra in, um, in BSS that doing it, doing something similar without seems to really push us to do something very different. So I, you know, I, I don't know of any, defensible application of uh, cut or spectral hypergraph specifiers with order of n hyper edges. But it seems like a good challenge to get some constructions or algorithms or theory for uh, hypergraphs that 
some simulates things we can do with linear algebra. And then maybe it can also then be helpful for um, more useful uh, application, you know, transfer even more useful applications of linear algebra from uh, graphs to other graphs. Okay, so I think that's actually uh, all the slides that I had uh, mm, prepared, but I so didn't go into much of the math for uh, any of those results. So to the extent that you have more time to stick around, I could say some more about any of those. Yeah, new one, thank you. Sorry. Okay, we can thank you for now. That was a wonderful yeah. survey of uh, results. Um, yeah, and uh, people can stick around. We can hear some more if you have still energy left. You want to answer questions in the meanwhile? Uh, yeah, sure. There's a couple in the chat. Uh, the how do I look at the chat? I don't see. Uh, oh, you don't see the chat in the Zoom? I can read uh, them. No, no, I, I do. It just uh, wasn't open. Uh, okay, so one says, are you sure there is no combinatorial interpretation? Maybe it says something about a cut of a blow up. Ah, uh, so the question was, is there a combinatorial interpretation? I guess I didn't see when it was asked. Uh, so I'm not sure what's a combinatorial interpretation. It was about spectral versus cut sparsifier. Uh-huh. Uh, for graphs. Yeah. Um, So maybe it's not a, okay, let me, first let me see if I can switch to a board. Do you see a white screen now? Yeah, okay, good. Let's see. Um, so maybe I'll give you an example of two graphs that are not a good uh, spectral approximation of um, each other. Although there is gonna be good um, cut approximation of each other. And so one is a cycle. And another is a cycle with a chord. So in terms of cut, there is a constant factor uh, approximation. And in fact, if you, some of you can arrange this construction a little differently, either way this, uh, the chord less or uh, maybe blow up each edge other than a chord into little bipartite graph. So then uh, if you do that, you can even get the approximation to be a arbitrarily small epsilon. Um, however, if you if you uh, if you give an assignment uh, like this. So if I adapt the sum of squares in the cycle, it's just uh, n, because each of the n edges, the difference is only one. But in the cycle with the chord, I'm getting n squared, order of n squared, because just the chord is contributing uh, n squared over four. Um, so I'm not sure if I can come up, some up. Uh, come up with a um, blow up of the graphs so that uh, cuts in the blow up are uh, 
kind of corresponding to quadratic forms in those graphs and get a similar effect that the, 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 the so this assignment of numbers uh, doesn't have a big uh, quadratic form in the cycle, but I pay so much for the, um, uh, for the chord. Uh, should love these two graphs that have a decent kind of effect. Okay, so maybe this is what I wanted to say about this uh, definition. If you had a constraint to upper edges, such that each upper edge is a tree or a path, will the bound be different? So I'm not sure what it means for a hyper edge to be a tree or a path. I mean, I'm guessing it means there's an underlying graph and then you select hyper edges to be some of the paths in this graph. Oh, I see. Um, Uh, okay. Yeah, I never thought about giving, uh, kind of giving structure to the um, hyperedges always uh, thought of them as, um, but basically I can imagine sort of uh, two possibilities. Either I can take an upper edge, sorry, I can take a hyper graph, in some way, think of it as coming from some graph. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what. Uh... Just sh share again, I, the share okay. some quits after a while. Oh, that's what happens, okay. Yeah. Your, the share isn't working or? Uh, uh, no, no, I just need to, <laughs> so you find, uh, uh, Got it. Okay, good, good. Um, so I was saying, I could sort of imagine that, um, so if you think about hypergraphs that are in some way derived from a graph, um, if there is some way to say, you know, I'm thinking about a hypergraph, but there is also in some way a graph associated with it. And then uh, if I, it's a kind of commuting uh, diagram. I don't know. Uh, there is some graph, there's some hypergraph H, but in some way, this is coming from some graph G. But then maybe I can 
sparsify, maybe not in the standard sense, but I can do something to G and create a G prime, and then look at what is the hypergraph H prime associated with G prime, and then sort of, uh, If I do this, hmm. uh, H prime will be a good approximation of um, H. So if that's what's uh, going on, and I think maybe there are interesting examples of this form. Somehow we're not studying, um, somehow all we're studying is how properties of graphs are uh, kind of implying properties of related hypergraphs. Uh, but I was, Kind of more interested in uh, kind of uh, hypergraph native uh, questions that are irreducible to uh, one uh, constant graph. And so, if the hypergraph is kind of generic, or if this uh, somehow if this diagram doesn't commute, I I feel that knowing that the uh, sort of hypergraph is some underlying graph structure, still wouldn't help me to uh, select hypergraphs that, uh, upper edges that give me some uh, uh, particular property. Like it wouldn't tell me what is the potential function by which I have to pick at every step or um, sort of what is the version of the lowest log lemma that would uh, uh, work. So somehow I think, so associating graphs to hypergraphs either switches the problem away from hypergraphs and then kind of doesn't get to this goal of uh, understanding how to work with hypergraphs. Or uh, it doesn't, but then it also maybe doesn't tell what to do on the hypergraph itself. So. Cool. Okay, I think uh, the lecture is, uh, was uh, long and uh, very interesting. So maybe we just take a few more questions. Uh, uh, it might be good. Uh, yeah, that's, um, so the question of Jason, it's uh, uh, why the contribution of a uh, hyper edge, it's something like uh, max for, uh, a, B, and E of, uh, I mean, I wrote it as max minus mean, but can also be written in this way. So if E is a hyper edge, so it's a set of vertices, the contribution of um, that hyper edge, uh, it's something like this. Um, so I guess we want uh, two properties of this, like, um, I don't know, imagine we have some uh, upper edge E formed by vertices A1, A2, A, R. So we, um, What is this function of the labels of the hyper edge that is an interesting generalization of the case of graphs? That somehow for uh, r equal to two, this would just be the uh, difference of uh, the squares. Because that's what uh, captures all the interesting linear algebra that is happening around the Laplacian quadratic form. And that if uh, the axes are uh, uh, zero, one, then F of, uh, maybe now we can directly write them as bits. This should be the, Uh, not all equal mm -hmm. of uh, B1 to BR. Uh, 
so I, I would say every, um, um, so every function that satisfies those two uh, properties is um, interesting. Uh, this one, uh, uh, so the, oops. Let's try. So this one was introduced by um, Anand Lewis in a paper that sort of was showing how summing these over the upper edges had several of the interesting properties of uh, the Laplacian, including satisfying the trigger inequality. Uh, definitely, um, a sort of, uh, so this is kind of infinite degree as a function of the um, X size because of the maximum. Um, something smoother would um, could potentially be easier to optimize or um, there could be something that comes from uh, thinking about uh, low degree approximations. I, I think this is all wide uh, open that um, the definition of uh, Alan Lewis doesn't, like this definition that I highlighted in yellow, doesn't have to be the only one that people think about. Um, but uh, no, so, um, so Jason was asking, well, what about something like um, the, what about the average of, uh, sort of the variance of the axis? Um, somehow for, for the way cuts work, I, I think I would want to distinguish as little as possible before say 0001 and uh, a sort of half zeros and uh, half ones. Uh, because otherwise, just uh, replacing every upper edge by a click or by a, an expander creates a graph in which um, kind of expressions like this are well approximated by the Laplacian of the graph. So in, so in challenging us to do something for hypergraphs that we don't really don't know how to do, I think it's useful to look at uh, quantities that on a hypergraph, they really cannot be approximated by similar quantities on an associated graph. So now it's at my last. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks also very much for all the question askers. And thanks so much for, to Luca for all this. Uh, excellent talk and really nice works and uh, see you next time yes thanks everybody for uh